Thank you. Thank you. So you're supposed to say, I am shorter but better looking. That's what you're supposed to say. Uh, okay, so uh, what we'll do today uh, is begin to talk about some basic deal structuring. And uh, what we'll describe is the way contracts are structured when they are involving complex business deals. This is true whether it is a Series A financing, whether it's an acquisition, whether it's a technology license, uh, whether it's a co-development agreement. Right? These are all contracts in the startup area, but they are also contracts and provisions that exist outside the startup area. And what you'll see over time is lawyers see the same problems come up over and over and over again, and they have the same tools to address those problems. And so when we describe these various issues, we'll talk about them really in the context today of an acquisition agreement. We'll do it in the context of uh, uh, an M&A, an acquisition agreement. But you'll see as we talk about it, the same ideas, the same concepts come up when we're talking about a founder's agreement. We'll talk about founder's agreements tomorrow. For those of you that come in on Saturday, uh, founders agreements, they also come up in Series A financings. We'll talk about Series A financings next week. Um, are you familiar with what a Series A financing is? You'll be experts, don't worry. You'll be experts. Um, so, so what we're doing is taking some basic concepts. They are really economics concepts, but we're using them to understand provisions in contracts. And I will tell you, uh, so as, as you, some of you may know, I practiced for 20 years. So I, I'm a little different than most law professors because I actually did the law. Shocking, right? Uh, and the, the ideas here that I'm describing are financial and economics ideas, but they are exactly how experienced lawyers think about these issues. So even though the term, so adverse selection, we'll talk about this in a moment, it's, it's an economics term. Even though the term adverse selection is not something that lawyers necessarily talk about, that term, it's exactly how they think uh, when looking at these types of deals. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about adverse selection. So adverse selection is a concept that originated in the United States uh, in the insurance market. And it came up in particular in areas involving life insurance or health insurance. And so let me give you an example of what we're talking about. It's basically an informational problem. It's this idea that one side may have more information than the other side. And what you will see over the course of today and tomorrow, constantly we're talking about differences in information. When you are doing a deal, about 70% of what you are doing is trying to bridge the gap in information between the buyer and the seller, the investor and the company, the co-partners in a joint venture. A large part of what you're doing involves this informational divide. Uh, and we see this in the insurance industry. So let's say, for example, I'm an insurance company, and I wish to, decide, I wish to create a new product. And the new product is going to be uh, prenatal health care, health care for uh, women who expect to have children. Uh, and that way, when they are pregnant, I will provide all the uh, funding for doctor's visits, visits to the hospital, and so forth. Right, so that's the idea behind our, our health plan here. <clears throat> now, as the insurance company, I really don't know how many people are planning to have families. I don't know how many people are thinking, maybe this is interesting, maybe not. And so what I will do in structuring the product is I will look at the total population and I will make an estimate uh, how many people plan to use this product. Because if everybody is going to use the product, it means the cost to me is greater, so I have to factor that into the price. If fewer people are using the product, perhaps the cost to me is less. So I have to judge. Now, each of you individually, you know what your plans are. Again, I don't know. So all I can do is make a judgment based upon the total market, kind of a guess as to how many people are likely to use this product. Well, the problem is, even though I'm calculating the costs over the general population, who do you think is most likely to buy this product? Are people that have no expectation to have children, do you think they will buy this product? No, right? The people who will buy the product will naturally be 
those people who expect, in the first instance, to use the product, to have children. And so the end result is insurers end up with the most expensive customers. I can try to guess, based upon the total market, some people will have children, some people don't, some people will plan, some people won't plan. I can make this judgment, but I have no real idea on what's inside your head. You do. And so knowing this, you're going to, if you are more likely to have a family, you are more likely to buy this product. And so it means that if I'm going to try to offer this product, even though I have no way of assessing any individual person, I am most likely to offer the product at a very, very expensive level. Right? It's a very inefficient way of doing business. If I knew how many of you were planning to have children, if I could read your minds, I could structure the product and price the product in a way that reflected actual demand. But because I can't do this, you have information, I don't, right? It's not transparent to me. It's an inefficient process. I will structure this product. I will make a product that I think reflects the likely market. But in fact, people that will use this product are most likely to be the most expensive customers. Good so far? Okay, so it's, an, it's a consumer. It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a, an insurance concept. So it's a problem of private information. You have private information that I don't have. And because you know if you will use the product and I don't, you will take advantage of this. If you're not expecting to have a family, you won't buy the product. If you are expecting to buy, have a family, you will buy the product. You will act in a way that is perfectly rational and you will buy the product based upon your private information, which I don't have. And so because of this, if I offer the product at too low a price, perhaps based upon the general population, the general likelihood of using this product, many of you will take advantage of me. Right? You will buy the product at this lower price, and I will end up with consumers who are more expensive. Make sense? Okay. It's a private information problem because I do not know how to price this product. So what do you think is going to happen? If I don't know how to price this product, what am I going to do? Well, as the insurer, I could go out and ask each one of you. Maybe you'll tell me the truth, maybe you won't. It's expensive, it's not reliable. It's expensive so it means the cost of the product goes up. But what else would I do? Not knowing what's really inside your heads. But I'm worried that the most expensive customers, the ones that will have children, they're the ones who are likely to buy this product. Right? The general population is maybe one way to start thinking about the product, but the likely consumers are people who are more likely to have children. So what do you think? Knowing this, what am I going to do? What would you do? What am I going to do? You're the insurance company. Congratulations. What are you going to do? You look out over Kharkiv and you say, okay, how many people in Kharkiv are going to use this product? What are you going to do? Yeah, but you can... Insurance. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. Insurance companies, even uh, if, if it's big uh, enough, uh, so it's um, um, doing their personal uh, personal statistics and even ask people on the street uh, this kind of information. What they need. Okay, so we can do this, but again, think about what I'm saying. This is a different question. The governmental organization and the insurance companies can make a general assessment of the market. So I know 30% of the market will have children in the next year. I know, based upon these statistics. But remember, I'm trying to price this policy. I'm creating a new product. 70% of the market doesn't really care about this. Now, I would like to offer the product to everybody, right? Because some people may not plan, but still benefit from having this insurance. So I'd like to offer the product to everybody. I can't force you to buy the product, right? I can't tell you must buy the product. So what does it mean? Who was most likely to buy this product? 
Who is most likely to buy? It's people who are going to have children, right? No, it's okay. Uh, uh, people um, who even want their children and don't know about your product, uh, they um, like every client, um, prospective client, a client wants to buy your product without any uh, any um, like uh, pressure. Any pressure? They, they want sure. To buy. They need to. Uh, they need. They, they need this product. No, absolutely. But 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 I know. Here's the problem, right? I know that there's a real risk that, let's assume, just for like, half of you are not going to have kids. Half of you will have kids, okay? I know that there's a real likelihood that you guys are all going to buy the product and you guys won't buy the product, right? If I offer the product to the market, are you going to buy it? No children, right? Not interested. Are you going to buy it? Absolutely. Right? So I have no way of different, but I don't really know this. Right? I don't know who actually is going to do this. So knowing that the, most, the more likely people to buy the product are people with children, how are you going to price this product? Is it going to be a small price? It's going to be an incredibly high price. Right? Think about this. Uh, because if the people who are buying the product are going to have children, it means they will use the product. And so if it costs, let's say, 10,000 grivna to go to the doctor, it means I must think about selling the product for at least 10,000 grivna because I don't know which one of you may or may not use the product. Now, I would still like to offer the product to the general population, right? I would still like to offer the product to everybody. So the fact is there may be some people in the population who don't plan to have children who would still buy the product if it was properly priced. <coughs> Right, so instead of being 10,000 grivna, if I priced it at 1,000 grivna, you might say, yeah, sure, I'm not planning to have children, but why not? Right, why not? Right, it's safe. Let's go ahead and do it anyways, if I could price it properly. The problem is, again, I don't know what percentage of the people will buy it at 1,000 grivna to be safe, and what percentage of the people will buy it simply because they expect to have children. I just don't know. And so because of this, I'm worried. I'm worried that all the 10,000 grivna people will buy the product, and if I only sell it for 1,000 grivna, I lose money. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to offer the price at a higher price, 10,000 grivna. Hey, are you guys going to buy it at 10,000 grivna? No, no. I shut the market down, right? When we have this type of an informational division, it means because I don't know who is having families who doesn't, because there's a risk I will lose money, I will be more conservative, I will increase the price, and it means that the market, this market, just goes away, right? So in the worst case, the market disappears. Because I don't know, I cannot assess the likelihood, the risk, that people will or won't have children based upon who will or will not buy the product, and so the market goes away. Very often it's just simply inefficient, but the idea here is there's no contract, there's no policy, but you will act opportunistically. You will act in a way that will benefit yourself, and that could hurt me. Make sense? Yeah? It's like, uh, I need a, a, a small hint uh, from you. A hint? I don't do hints. No, uh, okay. I don't, I don't, I'm a, okay. I'm a law professor. I, I never hint. Okay, um, I will, uh, I will, like, um, uh, come back to my uh, first, uh, like, previous, previous, uh, Some uh, ask, uh, ask like, um, sorry for my English. You know, uh, when a family who wants, who play, who plan uh, a children, a child, uh, and they know that if they not buy your uh, insurance uh, certificate, yes, they spend uh, a lot, uh, uh, like more money. And if they buy, they uh, have an uh, insurance. They have an, uh, some medical care. Mm -hmm. And so on, so on, and uh, their children um, will be safe. And for this reason, in their mind, they understand that uh, will understand that they need their products without any. Uh, well, any let, let me let me stop you. They need the product at a good price. Yes. If I charge too much, let's say that the cost to that family for medical care is ten thousand grivna. 
if I say this product I'm selling to you for 10,001 grivna, will you buy it? I will buy it. No, 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 no. Will, would you? But if the cost to you, but, but if the cost to you, if the cost to you is 10,000, if the cost of going to the hospital is 10,000 grivna for your whole family, and I sell you the product for 10,000 grivna, you won't buy it, right? That's the point. That's the point, right? These people over here may or may not go to the hospital. You will all go to the hospital. You will all have children, right? And so because of this, because of my concern that all of you will be my customers, none of you will be my customers, what will I do? I will charge 10,000 grivna because you guys will all go and use the facility, the hospital facility. If I knew that I could sell to an equal number, some here, some here, then maybe I would sell the product at 5,000, 4,000, 3,000 grivna, some smaller amount. Why? Because these guys will say, eh, maybe it's good, maybe it's not, but why not? It's not a big amount of money. You guys will benefit because you plan to have children. The problem is I don't know, you know even though I've divided the world here and here, I, it's really I don't know who is on what side. And so there's a real risk that if I price the insurance at 3,000 grivna, or let's say 5,000 grivna, you guys will say, not interested. And all of you guys will show up and say, yes, please let me buy. Well, if I'm selling you insurance at 5,000 grivna and you will all use the insurance and the cost to me will be 10,000 grivna, I go out of business. Right? That's the problem. And so if I am selling this product, if I could look inside everyone's mind, and say, okay, you will use it, you won't, you maybe, you maybe, maybe not, yes. Then I could do an average price that would reflect everybody's interest, and maybe it's 3,000, 4,000 grivna, something like this, right, 2,000 grivna. But because I don't know, you know whether you will use the product, I don't, you know, it means there's a real risk that the only people who buy the product are the ones who will use it. Well, because of this, I must, get, I must be very conservative. And so instead of offering the product for 1,000 grivna or 3 or 5 or 7, I offer the product for 10,000 grivna. You people maybe say, okay, 10,000 grivna, the cost to me is maybe 10,500 grivna, why not? You guys say no. And so effectively I am killing the market because of this informational difference. Make sense? I'm killing this market because I don't know which one of you will use the product, which one of you won't. I don't know which one of you are planning to have families, which one of you aren't, and as a result, I become very conservative in pricing. Good? Okay, let's do it again. We're going to do it now using my, my favorite example. It's my yellow jiggly example. Okay? Uh, this actually is referred to as a lemon's problem. Um, a lemon, as you know, is a fruit, but a lemon is also a word for a bad car in the United States, a lemon. Uh, and this is actually based on a, um, a paper that was written by a Nobel laureate. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize in economics for just this uh, paper. Uh, and basically he is describing the market problems when there is incomplete information. Uh, I should tell you, uh, this Nobel laureate, he is married to the chief banker uh, for the U.S. Federal Bank, the U.S. Central Bank. So you've got this, the head of the U.S. Central Bank, Nobel laureate in economics, married. Can you imagine being their children? What a, what a, what a nightmare, right? Uh, okay, so yellow jiggly. So let's assume for a moment we know the average price. I'm looking to buy a yellow jiggly, okay? And I know the average price and the average quality of a yellow jiggly. I don't know the particular price or particular quality of any one, but I know generally the average price of the yellow jiggly. Um, and, uh, and so based upon this, I decide I am prepared to buy 5,000, uh, spend 5,000 grivna on, uh, on uh, th this yellow jiggly. Is that too high or too low? 5,000, maybe too low? Hard to say, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> So, I decide I'm going to buy my yellow jiggly for 5,000 grivna, okay? Because I know that based on average quality, average price, the number of yellow jigglies that are out there, 5,000 grivna is about right. Good? 
Now, I am prepared to pay more if it's a good car, right? If it's a 6,000, 7,000 grivna car, I am prepared to pay more. But again, you know, on average, we know that the price is about 5,000 grivna. Okay, so I, can I write on this? I hope. Okay, good. Yeah, last time I uh, wrote on one of these boards, it didn't erase. So I'm very nervous now. Uh, okay, it erases. Okay, so here is my 5,000 grivna price. You are all sellers of yellow gigolis. If your yellow gigoli is worth uh, 6,000 grivna, will you sell it to me for 5,000 grivna? No, right? If your yellow gigoli is worth six, uh, 5,100 grivna, will you sell it to me for 5,000 grivna? No, right? If your yellow gigoli is worth 4,500 grivna, will you sell it to me for 5,000? Yes. If it's worth 4,000, will you sell it to me for 5,000? Yes, right? So what does it mean? It means that if I am prepared to buy the yellow gigoli at 5,000, I know that the average price, right, I think this is based upon the market, I know that the average price and quality of the cars you offer me is going to be less than 5,000, right? In other words, this is the average price based upon the entire market, 10,000 down to zero, but at, at 5,000 and one grivna, you're not gonna sell me the car for 5,000. Only people with cars that are worth 4,900, 4,800, 4,500, you will sell to me. 5,001 grivna, you will not sell it to me for 5,000. Why would you give up a grivna? Maybe, right? So it means that the average quality of the cars that are offered to me, because I don't know, right? I cannot look into your minds. The average quality of the cars that you offer to me is actually below $5,000. Right? It will be 4,900, 4,800, so forth. The average quality is maybe 4,000 grivna, right? Maybe. So, I was going to offer to buy the car at 5,000 grivna, but I know that if I offer to buy it at 5,000, only lower quality cars will be sold to me. Knowing this, what am I going to do? Well, what could you do knowing this? If you know... If you know that the uh, average quality of the car is below 5,000, right? Because no one will offer me a car above 5,000. So the average quality and the average value of the car is below 5,000. If, you, if, 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 uh, if uh, I know this clearly, right? how do I get comfortable with what it is you're selling to me? How could I get comfortable? What would I do? What would you do if you're the buyer? What would you do? Okay, Whitehead shows up. You say you're offering the car, you're, you're offering to buy, you're not the buyers, congratulations. You're the buyers now, okay? And Whitehead shows up and says, hey, I have this really great yellow gigoli, you should buy it for 5,000 grivna, right? It's worth at least 5,000 grivna, maybe, maybe more. What are you gonna do? How do you get comfortable? We could ask for a discount, but you know, no, but you said 5,000, here's this car. We'll get to a discount in a moment. Discount is a good answer, but wait. Right. What are you going to do? How do you get comfortable that this car is really worth 5,000 grivna? What would you do? Ha yeah, right? You would hire a mechanic. Hire a mechanic, hire other people to come and look. Now, the mechanic, it turns out, costs 1,000 grivna to hire, okay? Are you going to buy the car if it's worth 5,000 grivna, where you must give me 5,000 grivna plus the mechanic 1,000 grivna? So the cost to you to buy this 5,000 grivna car is 6,000 grivna. Are you going to buy this car? Well, well, we haven't gotten a discount yet. We haven't gotten to a discount yet. Right? You know, the answer is no, right? You would not buy, if I'm saying to you, if you say, look, I will buy the car, and the car really is worth 5,000, but it costs you 1,000 grivna to verify this, so the, the real cost to you is 6,000 grivna, why would you ever buy a 5,000 grivna car for 6,000 grivna? It makes no sense, right? Why would you ever do this? There you go, okay. 
right? So it means that, yes, you would come back and say, Whitehead, this car is worth, you, you say this car is worth 5000 I have verified the car is worth 5000 but it costs me 1000 to do this, right? It makes no sense to the buyer to buy a 5,000 grivna car for 6,000 grivna in, in expense. It makes no sense. So then what might you do? Ask for a discount, right? Say, look, okay, Whitehead, go ahead and sell me the car at 4,000 grivna, okay? Or what you might do is simply say, look, from now on, because I know the risk that I will end up with a low quality car is now high, I will simply buy for 4,000 grivna. That's just my job. I will decide to buy for 4,000 grivna. By the way, is Whitehead going to sell you his 5,000 grivna car for 4,000 grivna? Nah, put aside circumstances. Will Whitehead sell a, well, should I sell a 5,000 grivna car to you for 4,000 grivna? Shouldn't, right? So you're now, but you're now recognizing the problem, need to hire a mechanic, you were prepared to offer 5,000 grivna. Now you're only prepared to offer 4,000 grivna, either because you are discounting the price because of risk. You don't know if it's good, good car or bad car, or because you have to hire a mechanic. Now you're prepared to buy it at 4,000 grivna. Okay, 4,000 grivna. Is Whitehead's 5,000 grivna car, am I going to offer it to you for 4,000 grivna? No, right? 4,500 grivna car. Will I offer it to you for 4,000 grivna? No. 3,900 grivna car, will I offer it to you for 4,000? Absolutely. It's the same problem all over again. And so the price drops and drops and drops, and eventually the market is gone. Right? That's what the Akerlof paper, it's a guy, by the, his name is George Akerlof. That's what the Akerlof paper is about. Make sense? Right? In other words, informational differences you know the quality of your car. You know. Is it really a 5,000 grivna car? I don't. Because of this informational difference, and because I cannot separate the good cars from the bad cars, the 5,000 grivna cars from the 2,000 grivna cars, either I will have to spend money to do this, or I will discount the price because of risk. Because of this, the market goes away. You like this? Kind of cool, huh? Okay. The whole point is, what lawyers do is we bridge this information gap. This is really a large part of what lawyers do. Right? Our goal is to avoid the market from going away, avoid the discount, figure out a way for the seller to convey information to the buyer, uh, for the uh, and company uh, to convey information to the investor, right? for uh, the founders of a company to convey information to each other. Right? Really what lawyers are doing, it's not all of what we're doing, but a large part of what we do is try to bridge this informational gap. Because if you don't, the market becomes less efficient, and when it becomes less efficient, potentially it even goes away. You are efficiency engineers. You like that? Never thought about it. You never thought about it, but you're efficiency engineers. You're really there to try to span this information gap. Uh, okay. Um, let's take a look. So, the lemons problem, right, the yellow jiggly that I just described, applies equally in the M&A context. It's exactly the same problem. Instead of 5,000 grivna, we're talking $5 billion. It's the exact same issue, though, right, where I am a buyer, I am looking to buy a business, and I have to separate the good businesses from the bad businesses, businesses that are really worth $5 billion from businesses that are worth only $3 billion. Right? That is really what is going on when you are doing a large acquisition. Uh, and so in the corporate context, you really are asking two questions. Am I buying a good business or a bad business? Just like am I buying a good car or a bad car? A good jiggly or a bad jiggly? Right? In this case where I'm buying a business because, of course, for $5 billion, will you sell me your $6 billion business for $5 billion? No, will you sell me your $4 billion business for $5 billion? Absolutely, it's the exact same way of thinking. So I have to separate the good businesses from the bad businesses, and I need to have information 
in order to do this, in order to figure out the value of the deal, is the value six billion or five billion or four billion, I need information. And so just like our insurance problem, just like our yellow gigolee problem, in the M&A context, numbers are much bigger, we're also dealing with information. These are all information problems. You like this? Kind of cool, huh? By the way, if you, if you, uh, if you say this to, um, if you say this to uh, lawyers, they will say, what are you talking about? This is how they think, though. They don't use these words, but this is very much how experienced deal lawyers think. Um, by the way, how do you persuade? How do you persuade me when you are the seller of a good jiggly that it's really worth value? Now, one way, we talked about hiring a mechanic. Right? But that's expensive. So when we hire a mechanic, it means that the 5,000 grivna zhiguli now costs you 6,000 grivna. Why would you do this? Right? It's inefficient. So we could go ahead and hire a mechanic, but that's expensive. We could discount the price. That's also inefficient. Will you sell me your 5,000 grivna car for 4,000 grivna? No. <coughs> So what's another way to get me comfortable that this really is a 5,000 grivna car? So you'll lie to me. No. You'll lie to me. So, what are, you, so what, what are you telling me? You can sell me the car. Ah, I'm a law professor. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't work. Okay, so another way of saying it is the seller has to warranty the car, right? It's referred to sometimes as a performance warranty, right? So you, you as the seller, who knows more about this car, you or me? You do, right? The sellers, right? If I am comfortable that the warranty is enforceable, in other words, you will not disappear, that I can come after you if it turns out the warranty is wrong, so you say to me, the car is good, has great radio, great uh, engine, blah, 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 right? And you give me a warranty that says this, so long as I am comfortable that I can uh, enforce this warranty, you're not going to run away, then maybe I will accept this warranty because you know more about the car without having to bring a mechanic in. Another way of saying it is the warranty in this case is worth a thousand grivna, right? The warranty, there's real value to these warranties. If you did not give me the warranty, we'd have to hire a mechanic. Thousand grivna. If I can get comfortable that this warranty, that you really know this car and you will take the risk of this car, you will take the responsibility for this car, it means in that case I can go ahead and without a mechanic, buy the 5,000 grivna car for 5,000 and we save money. We both save money. Right? I don't have to hire the mechanic and worry about discounting. You don't have to sell it at a lower price. So another way of saying this is when we talk about reps and warranties, right, you'll hear about them in contracts. We'll do some examples. Uh, but these have value. I know that when young lawyers look at them, you think, eh, it's just something in a contract. Right? Very common reps and warranties, uh, representations and warranties. For example, it's things like the company is duly incorporated or the stock has been validly issued, or in the case of a company, that the factory is in good, good operation, good repair, or that there are no liabilities, or there are no major lawsuits. These are all representations that are in a contract. When you are investing in a startup, right, very often one of the representations is company has rights to all the intellectual property in that, country, in that company. Right, that all the key technology the investor is investing in, the company has either licensing rights or ownership rights. Right? It looks, if you read it, it looks kind of boring, actually. <laughs> right? It's just, oh, this is just kind of standard language in a contract. You have to understand, what we're really doing is saving money. It actually is a way to more efficiently convey information. Because if you did not have the warranty, the buyer would either discount the price because there's a risk, you are a bad jiggly, or I would go out and hire someone to verify this information, in which case the cost to me of doing this deal is greater 
than if we have the warranty. So the warranty is conveying information at a lower cost. Why is it lower cost? Because you have this information. You know this, it's your company, it's your Jigali. So it's easier for you to make me comfortable with this so long as I am confident that it's an enforceable uh, uh, warranty. Make sense? Yeah. Kind of cool, huh? Makes Sorry? Makes perfect. Makes perfect sense, yeah. Okay. Um, so, when I'm doing an acquisition, just like when I'm doing a yellow jiggly, right, if I don't know the real value of the company, I am likely to go ahead and discount the price. Uh, what we want to do, if we are the seller, right, the buyer needs enough information to know that the business is a good business, not a lemon, and also we need to be able to convince you, the seller, like through a performance warranty, must credibly convince me that the value really is $5 billion, right? In other words, I have to be able to rely upon your warranty and not hire a mechanic, not hire other people to verify the price, not discount the price based upon this warranty. Make sense? If it doesn't make sense, tell me, it's okay. It's really okay. By the way, in the United States, uh, we typically don't lecture. I do more lecturing in Ukraine than I do in the United States. I usually just ask a lot of questions. So you'll see I ask questions here. This is nothing, okay? But, but the, the reason I mention this is because it's okay to ask questions. Or it's even okay to tell me, Whitehead, that's wrong. It happens. I'm never wrong. But, but it does happen, okay? So don't hesitate. If you're not following, let me know. Uh, because uh, this is not such an obvious thing. Uh, really what I'm doing is introducing you to how sophisticated, experienced deal lawyers think. This is what we think about reps and warranties. We don't think, ah, it's just ridiculous words. We don't think, ah, it's boring stuff. We really think it is a way to assess value, right? It is a baseline of value. Reps and warranties tie into price. If I am not confident that the jiggly is worth 5,000 grivna because you will not give me a warranty or you give me a warranty on some things and not other things or maybe I'm worried the warranty is not good. Maybe you will run away and I can't enforce the warranty. In all these cases, I will change the price because it becomes less, uh, more of a risk. Uh, I'm less confident in the nature of what I'm buying and so I'm more likely to discount the price. So reps and warranties and price are very much tied together, right? Uh, okay, so what is our goal? Our goal is to try to design uh, a structure for mergers and acquisitions. But again, just so you understand, we're using M&A as an example. This applies equally to Series A investments, seed financing, co-development agreements, licensing agreements, all of the things that you see in a startup apply equally, these, these concepts apply equally there. It's just easier to illustrate with an acquisition. Uh, so design an acquisition structure that mitigates adverse selection, limits this informational divide between us, limits the risk that I am buying a bad jiggly, right? That's what we're trying to do. Uh, where, when we talk about acquisition, uh, we're not talking about, there are many different types of acquisition structures. I'm not worried about acquisition structures. If you ever want to talk about M&A structures, I teach M&A too. Different discussion though. Here we're just talking about acquiring a bundle of assets and acquiring some uh, revenues. So transactions take a number of forms. Um, one of the key differences, by the way, that you should be sensitive to is an asset acquisition as opposed to a stock acquisition. Uh, why do you think that's different? So here I have a company. Let's, this room is the company. And I could buy the company, the stock and all the company, or I could go around and buy the table and the chairs and the tripod and so forth, right? Stock acquisition is where I buy the entire company, everything, right? It's all mine. An asset acquisition is where I go and I buy the assets in the company. What's the difference? So generally, we're talking about just one standard concept, right? We're talking about just functional acquisition. I don't care the structure. The one key structural difference that you need to be sensitive to 
is the difference between an asset purchase and a stock purchase. All right? It affects the information you ask for. This information that we're talking, the performance warranties, the informational divide, it really does depend on whether it's an asset deal or a stock deal. Why? What's the difference? Who's, who, who's, has anyone done an M&A deal or worked on an M&A deal? You all take in corp business, business organizations, right? Ah, come and take it with me. I spend half the time on M&A. So again, this, let's assume this whole room is the company. And so I can buy the company and the stock in the company and the entire corporation, the entity. Or I can go around and buy the assets in the company. What's the difference? Right? And so once, if I, do this, if I do the asset acquisition, everything is going to be here. Why? I mean, look, I, it's the same thing. Right? If, it's, if it's a stock acquisition, this is here. I get the whole thing. If it's an asset acquisition, this is here too. I, I should tell you, in the United States, there are some tax differences. Forget that. Well, I'm getting the right, I'm, I'm getting, so if, if it's an asset, I get it, right? If the rights are assets of the company, I'm buying those assets. You're, you're, you're going down the right path. Keep on going. Keep on going. You're, you're, you're starting down the right path. I'm sorry? But I have the, but I have the whole company, don't I? Right? Well, I will, but I'll buy the assets. I'll buy the name. I'll buy the employee. The, so you're the employees. I take your employee contracts, uh, customer lists. I get all the customer lists. Bank accounts. I get all the bank accounts. No, I get all that stuff. Those are all assets in addition to this, right? If it's uh, an asset of the company, it's mine. Yeah, sure, but in this case, in this case, I am the same person in either case. Either I will buy the stock of the company or I will simply buy all the assets of the company, including, you know, it's including operational assets, you know, the name, trademark, you know, whether it's patented or copyrighted or trade secret doesn't matter. If it's an asset, it's mine. Right? And so I can either buy all, the, I'm buying all the assets, everything in the room, or I buy the room. What's the difference? What do you buy when you buy assets that you do not buy when you buy the company? This is a test. This is, this is a tough, tough one. Liabilities, perfect answer, yeah, right? That's the big difference, right? If I buy the entire company, I buy everything in this company, right? Including assets and liabilities, right? And by liabilities, what do I mean? I don't necessarily mean debt. It could be debt, but it also could mean future lawsuits, right? Anything that is a liability now or in the future anything that either has occurred or might occur, a liability, those I am not buying. If I buy the company, I get everything. Assets, liabilities, you name it. Whether I'm sued now, sued in the future, debt now, debt in the future, I get the whole thing, right? If I'm simply buying the assets, I am not buying the liabilities. So what does it mean? If you are structuring uh, the reps and warranties in an asset acquisition, so long as it's clear that there are no liabilities, you don't worry about this, right? In terms of the reps and warranties, you don't care about liabilities. On the other hand, if you're buying the entire company, you spend a lot of time on liabilities, right? I want to know what lawsuits are there. I want to know what risks might arise now or in the future, right? And so you spend a lot of time on liabilities in reps and warranties. If I'm simply buying the assets, I want to know the table is good. I want to know that the uh, trademark is good. 
I want to know that the contracts are good. Great. Obviously important stuff, but you don't worry as much about the liabilities. Good? Okay. Um, so, what are we doing? We're buying, uh, again, very general. We're buying an income stream, right? Rights to income. Uh, with the risk, income may go up or down. Uh, and the buyer needs enough information in order to determine what it's buying, right? The buyer needs to know, is it a good jiggly or a bad jiggly? And one key purpose of the acquisition agreement is to provide credible information. It's like our performance warranty, right? The acquisition agreement has reps and warranties in it as a credible means to convey information that yes, this is a good business. Yes, the value is $5 billion. Yes, it is a good jiggly. It's a 5,000 grivna jiggly, not a 4,000 grivna jiggly. Good? Uh, okay, so lawyers are very much involved in this. And I will tell you, in practice, so it, how, I don't, how many of you are thinking of doing tech, tech startup work? It's okay, you, you don't have to see it. None of you are thinking of doing tech startup work? How many of you are thinking corporate or business work? Okay, I'm saying, how, oh, you can raise your hands, it's okay. It's, 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 it's not like I'll say, oh, you know, five years from now, I'll come back and say, what? You're not doing corporate work? No, it doesn't, it's okay. Yeah. The, the reason why I ask this is, what you will find over time is, good lawyers, good business lawyers, understand the issues around business structuring better than the business people. It's not to say that you know the business. Business people know the business. But you will have done tens and hundreds of these deals, and so you will know how to think about the issues, you will know how to address the issues, the type of information you need, much more than the business people will. Uh, and so the lawyer, a transactional lawyer, really is an engineer, right? You have a particular skill set. You're not business people, right? You might become business people, but as the lawyer, you're not the business person, but you really understand the kinds of issues and the kinds of informational problems that need to be addressed. So a deal lawyer looks at what information is needed, asks, how can I make sure this is credible information? Can I rely upon this information? Can I rely upon the person? Is she running away? Or am I comfortable that if there's a problem, I can get the value of the representation warranty? What does the information tell us? If there are risks, so you now give me some warranties, and I suddenly realize, oh my goodness, there's a risk. For example, I'm looking to buy the yellow jiggly. And I say, please give me a warranty. Right? And you say, okay, I'll give you a warranty on the radio and on the windows and on the engine. And I'll give you a warranty on three of the tires. Okay? What does that tell you? Something may not be good with the fourth tire, right? Again, th again, the whole purpose here is to assess price. And so at that point, the buyer must say, oh my goodness, maybe not all the tires are good. I might say, instead of 5,000 grivna, 4,800 grivna. That would be one way to manage the risk. I simply discount the price to reflect the risk that one of the tires is not good. Or maybe there's some other way, right? Maybe what I say is, okay, I'm not gonna ask for a warranty on four uh, tires but I want you to agree you will give me a fourth tire if there's a problem, something like that, who knows, right? So how do we, uh, if there are risks, how do we manage the risks? And what about missing information, right? Very often there's information that neither of us knows about. How do we manage the risk? Who takes the risk if there's information? For example, maybe there's a new law in Kharkiv that says yellow jigglies are illegal, right? But we don't know this. There's a risk that you will sell me the yellow jiggly and two weeks or two months or two years later, there will be a law that outlaws yellow jigglies on the streets. Well, do you know the risk? I don't know the risk. Maybe it's a risk that I must bear. Maybe it makes sense. I'm buying the car, I should take the risk. Uh, but again, to the extent that there is some uncertainty or some missing information, how do we decide between us who takes the risk of this information? And what you'll see is the acquisition agreement, the contract reflects this informational collection, this uh, provision of information, and also how we decide to divide the, um, the risks. Good? Good? Kamchatka, good? <laughs> right, okay. 
Okay, so typical acquisition agreement, right? We describe the deal, what's being sold. We talk about the price. Yeah, uh, am I buying it for cash or stock or something else? Timing of the payment. Reps and warranties. This is what we're spending a lot of time on now. Covenants we'll come to in a moment. Uh, indemnification. We'll talk about indemnification maybe today. If not today, we'll talk about it tomorrow. But indemnification is a way to, is a provision that says, if the rep or warranty or covenant is wrong, is incorrect, you'll give me money. By the way, you guys have taken contracts, right? Here in Ukraine? Yeah? Contract law. You took contract law, right? Okay. So let me ask, if I give you a warranty and a contract, right, and I breach the warranty, so I give you a warranty that the window is good and the window is bad, can you sue me under contract? Can you? It's not a trick question. Yes, thank you very much. You scared me there for a moment. Yes, of course you can sue me under warranty, right? Now, in most substantial deals, there is an indemnification. And the indemnification says, if there is a breach of a rep or a warranty or a covenant, the uh, person who has breached will give money to the other side. Do we need an indemnification? These, I should tell you, these indemnifications are usually pages long, two, three, four pages long. Very complicated. Lawyers yell at each other, throw things. I, I'm not exaggerating. The indemnity is where there's really, really fighting. But do you need it? Huh? Who said no? Who said no? Who said no? It was a good answer. Who said no? Right? right? As a matter, whoever whispered it, as a matter of contract law, you shouldn't need it. So why is it there? We'll get to that either later today or tomorrow. You'll see the indemnity is very deceptive. A lot of provisions in these contracts are really deceptive. Uh, in fact, instead of giving you rights, which is what it reads, it limits them. We'll see when we get to indemnities. Okay, conditions to closing. Uh, okay, so how do you know what you're buying? We've talked about this already. Right? Reps and warranties provide the baseline so that you know the value of what you're buying. Uh, very often uh, it's specified in the contract or in schedules. Uh, many acquisition agreements are about 100 pages long. If it's a big deal, 100 to 120 pages long. They're about this big though. And the reason is they identify all of the assets that are being sold. Uh, and so as a result, there are huge schedules that are attached to these agreements that are your computer printouts and they're very, very big. So what we do is we provide this baseline of information specifying what we're buying and we rely upon reps and warranties to convey information about these assets, to convey information about what's in the schedule. What we'll also see is reps and warranties also tie into other provisions of the contract, conditions to closing, the covenants, and the indemnification. One of the things to also just mention now, we'll see this again, when you read a contract, a complicated business contract, you read it holistically. It's like, it's like yoga, right? You sit there and meditate and it all comes together, right? Contracts are the same way. Even though you have different sections of a contract, reps and warranties, covenants, conditions to closing, indemnification, you read them together. And the reason is because the reps and the warranties affect the conditions to closing. The reps and the warranties affect the indemnity. The reps and the warranties can even affect covenants, other provisions in the contract. If you understand this point, you are ahead of many lawyers. I, I cannot tell you how many deals I have worked on where I have given up. It's very fun. I've given up reps and warranties. So I, I'm on the buyer side or I'm on the seller side. Maybe on the seller side, I'm giving lots of reps and warranties. Or on the buyer side, I give them all up. And I'm sure the lawyer on the other side of the table is saying, God, this whitehead is terrible. He's giving up everything. Oh, no, no, no. Because what I say to him is, I build up a lot of uh, goodwill. I say, yeah, you have everything you want on the reps and warranties. I think I should have these provisions in the covenants, in the conditions to closing, in the indemnity. And it gets rid of everything in the reps and warranties. 
right? You have to read everything together. We'll, we'll see that, how that works in a, uh, uh, later on. Uh, okay, so uh, we're talking about reps and warranties. Now, you might say to yourself, reps and warranties should be positive. Every time you ask as the buyer for a warranty, I should give it to you. So you want a warranty about the radio in the uh, yellow jiggly. Why? Because it's really important, right? You're the buyer. It's really important. I say, fine, you have a warranty about the radio. You want a warranty about the, uh, the windshield, the glass. Fine, no problem. The tires, the engine, fine, no problem, right? Why? Well, why should I be willing to give this to you? Well, we talked about this, right? If I don't give this to you, what are you going to do? H hire a mechanic, discount the price, right? Uh, and so I benefit as the seller because you will now buy the yellow jiggly at 5,000 grivna. You benefit because you don't have to hire the mechanic. You don't have to discount the price. So we should both agree reps and warranties are good, right? In theory. It means I should just give them to you. Whatever you want, so long as I have knowledge about it, Right? I cannot give you a warranty about the future law against yellow jigglies in Kharkiv, but everything else, so long as I know about it, I should be comfortable giving you reps and warranties. So it should be a positive sum game. It reduces this informational gap. It minimizes the buyer's costs and lets you buy the deal without a discount. Right? That's one theory. Um, Non-cooperation is a signal. If I ask for a warranty about the tires and you say no, or you say yes for three, not for a fourth, that's a signal. It's information. When you're negotiating the reps and warranties, you're getting information. I want a warranty about the engine. I want a warranty that the engine is in great condition, triple A condition. Seller says, can't give it to you. What do you what, by the way, what happens when the seller says, can't give it to you? What's, what, what, what's the immediate thing that you say? It's the word that young lawyers hate to use. It's the word that experienced lawyers always use. Okay, so here, I want a rep and a warranty that the engine is in AAA condition. You say, can't give it to you. I say, no. Almost, I might end up there. I might end up there, but before I end up there, I may end up there, but before I end up there, what do I say? One word, one word. You're almost, yeah, something, one word. I want a warranty, AAA engine. You say no. I say, why? <laughs> why not? <laughs> or why not? It is, young lawyers hate to say this because you think, oh, it shows I don't know. No, this is what you should be doing. I got to tell you, the word I use the most when I negotiate deals is why, <laughs> right? Because I really want to understand. If I understand why, maybe it's because you say, you know what, I can't give you triple A. I can give you double A plus. Maybe that's good enough, right? Or maybe you say, I can't give you triple A because the car was in an accident. It's fixed, right? Everything is good. The mechanic has agreed, but I really can't tell you it's a brand new engine. Okay, these are all bits of information. Then maybe I say cut the price, right? Then maybe I go back to my client and I say, you know what, this car was in an accident. My client goes, oh, I didn't know this. Instead of 5,000, maybe it's 4,800. But the point is, you are through the negotiations, you are actually forcing out information. As the seller, you will not give me, hopefully, unless you are prepared to take real risk, you will not give me warranties that you know are wrong. You might, hoping I will never see it. It's a risky game. Uh, more likely, you will provide warranties that you think reflect your actual knowledge. And based upon this discussion, I will then learn more about what you know. And then we'll agree. So you'll say, I can give you double A plus. I'll say, okay, let me talk to my client. My client says, yeah, it's good. And we put that in the contract. My client may also negotiate the price. I let my client worry about that. Uh, but what I'm doing is forcing information from you to me. By the way, in the case of an asset, uh, in the case of an uh, M&A deal, I'm the acquirer, right? I'm buying your company. I'm going to ask lots of information about you, right? I'm buying your company, just like I'm buying the Yellow Jigali. 
when might you want information about me? Or uh, under what circumstance do you want to know about me? So I'm, I'm Whitehead Company. Why, right, why, uh, that's my hypothetical business, Whitehead Company. Um, how do you say it? Tsveti Galava something. Uh, okay. So I'm Whitehead Company, and I'm buying your company. All right? So as Whitehead Company, as the buyer, I want to know lots of information about your company. Right? Operations, assets, liabilities, lawsuits. Company is good, f properly formed. Stock is issued. Right? Lots of information. When might you want to know information about me? You're the sellers, right? I'm the buyer. When might you want to know? Yeah. No, but what kind of information? What do I already know? I know nothing. Here's why I know nothing. Here's why I know nothing. Well, no, let's, let's go. Here's why. Unless it's in the contract, I know nothing. Right? Whatever you may have told me, unless it's in the contract, it's not something I can rely upon. Key point. We will see an example of this in a moment. Right? If it's not in the contract, you cannot rely upon it because it's the baseline of information in the contract. It's the warranty that you rely upon. So what do I know? If it's not in the contract, I know nothing. So what do you want to know about me? What is a guarantee for me? What do you, uh, you mean, what, what do I want? I want everything. Well, I want, I want complete assurance that whatever you tell me is accurate. And if it's not accurate, I want to be able to come back to you later and say, give me money. Right? You said, you said the wind, windows were good. They're not good. I have suffered some loss. I lost 1,000 grivna. Pay me 1,000 grivna. That's what I want. It must be enforceable, and I must be able to get my money back. Hostile takeover. Yes. Ooh, okay. And for example, let's talk. Hostile takeovers are a little special. Um, hostile takeovers are hostile. There is no negotiation, right? Uh, are you familiar with hostile takeovers? In the, a little bit. In the United States, sometimes companies buy other companies when they don't want to be bought. I know, it sounds pretty nasty, right? So the company is public. It's traded. So Whitehead Co. is, Whitehead Co. is public. It's, it's traded. Here's Whitehead Co. It's public. It's traded. has lots of shareholders. And what happens? Uh, uh, Simpson Co. Simpson Co. is the is the nasty acquirer. Okay, hostile acquirer. Sorry. Uh, and Simpson Co. goes to the stockholders and says, "I want to buy your stock." It's hostile because the board of Whitehead Co. doesn't want to talk to Simpson Co. That's why it's hostile, right? And so Simpson Co. says, "Okay, I'm not going to talk to the board." I will go directly to the shareholders and buy their stock. There's no negotiation. Okay? No negotiation on a hostile. The acquirer just goes directly to the shareholders and buys their stock. And I, I you know, what do I do? It's, I, it's, it's the shareholder's stock. I, I not, there are things I can do to block it. There's a lot of law in this area. Someday I should come back and do an M&A class, a whole M&A class. Just, we, can just, uh, we can do weeks on this. I used to do a lot of M&A. Uh, but... The point is there's no negotiation. So, okay, I'm the buyer. You're the sellers. I want to know lots about you. What else do you want to know about me? Nothing? Ah, good question. Okay. So you might want to know, do I have the funding in place? Very common. Right? So in big acquisitions, the, the seller says, look, before I do this deal, I want to know either that you have the money or that you have access to the money. Uh, maybe some bank has agreed to give you the money. Very common, you will see that in the contract. 
Okay, when would you want to know more about me? So I want to know everything about your business. I want to know about assets and liabilities and operations and uh, lawsuits and everything. When would you want to know this about me? Let me ask you, instead of buying your company for cash, what happens if I buy your company for my stock? Right? In other words, you're the seller of your company. I could buy your company for cash. If I buy your company for cash, all you want to know is, do I have the cash? Right? And once the deal is closed, you take the cash and you go and you live on a beach somewhere, right? But not all acquisitions are done for cash. Sometimes it's cash and something else, or just something else, stock. So what I might say to you is, okay, I want to buy your company. Right? For every one share of your company I buy, I will give you two shares of my company. Right? So it means that I will end up taking over your company, but you will end up with a lot of my stock. In that case, are you interested in my assets and liabilities? Absolutely, right? So if it's a cash deal, it tends to be very one-sided, right? The buyer simply wants to know, do I have the cash? And they want to make sure that this is also legal, that I've been authorized, but it's very simple. Uh, in a stock deal, it's called a stock for stock deal, the reps and the warranties are parallel, right? What I want to know about you, you want to know about me. Why? You're getting my stock, right? I'm getting your company, you're getting my stock, so you want to know about me. Make sense? Good? Okay. Um, okay, so we think, in theory, reps and warranties should be, you know, easy, right? You want it, I give it to you. Uh, so long as I know it, I should give it to you. In fact, in the real world, reps and warranties are heavily negotiated. They are not cooperative. Uh, right, the, uh, the process doesn't feel cooperative. <laughs> it will go on for days sometimes, the negotiation on reps and warranties. Uh, and meanwhile, again, you should be telling your client, I learned this, I learned that. Why? Well, one, one, one reason why the seller could resist giving reps and warranties is they just don't like risk. If I give you the warranty, I take the risk the warranty is wrong. So really what the warranty is doing is shifting the risk about the, the glass, about the engine, about the radio. It's shifting the risk from the buyer to the seller. And maybe the seller says, look, once I've sold this business, I just want to forget about it. I don't want to worry about any additional risk. I don't care. Right? So it simply could be the seller doesn't want risk. Um, fewer representations may also make it easier to get the deal done. I'm not going to get sued, and there is less reason for you to walk away. One of the things that appears in a contract is called a condition to closing. We will come to it in a moment. A condition to closing says, so let me ask you, 5,000 grivna. Okay, we all have five, I hope. Uh, 5,000 grivna. It turns out you agree to buy my car for 5,000 grivna, but you don't have the 5,000 grivna with you, right? It's going to take you a week to get the money and to buy my car. But you want, and I want, you want to commit, sign the contract saying you will buy the car, and I want you to sign the contract saying you will buy the car, but we know that between now and one week from now, you're not going to have the money. One week from now, you'll have the money, and then I can give you the car. Am I going to give you the car now, no money? Ain't happening. Sorry, not happening. Right? A week from now, I will give you the car, and then you'll give me money. Now, what could happen during that week? No, we signed a contract. We signed a contract. The Yeah, but we signed a car. I agreed I will sell you the car in one week for 5,000 grivna so long as certain conditions are satisfied. You get the car. So I saw five. if she says 6,000, doesn't matter. I agreed. So long as the conditions are met, I will give you 5,000. I, I will sell you the car for 5,000 grivna. 
Yeah, something can happen during that week, right? Uh, that one week period. And so what conditions to closing say is the reps and warranties speak twice. First, when the contract is signed, and second, they must be accurate a week later when we close the deal, right? Because something could happen in that one week period. And so, okay, I will agree to buy the car or uh, sell the car for 5,000 grivna. You will buy it for 5,000 grivna. But before you actually give me the money a week later, you want to know that it's still accurate. So conditions to closing uh, tie back into the reps and warranties. Uh, if I have fewer warranties, there is lower risk that the conditions will not be satisfied. Right? In other words, if I give you lots of reps and warranties, there's a risk the conditions won't be satisfied, that maybe something will, be, uh, something will have changed. But fewer reps and warranties mean likely that the deal will get done. Very often, there are also negotiation tactics in deals. Um, in other words, we know, lawyers know, that we are sharing information. We know. Sometimes it's good to be noisy, to, to send, send a noisy signal. So what happens? You want a representation about the window. Sure. You know what I'll do? I'll negotiate, though. I have no problem giving you the warranty on the, on the window. No, I can't give it to you. Oh, but Whitehead, windows are so important. Yeah, I know, but I mean, they're, they could break. I don't know, I can't, how can I tell my client to give you a warranty on the window? But Whitehead, the warranty is important. Windows are important. Oh, okay, you've convinced me. For you, I will do it, okay? Windows, okay, engine, engine. Whitehead, I want a warranty on the engine. Engines are so complicated. Can I give you a warranty that the engine is good? I mean, how can I tell my client to do this? It's real risk. But Whitehead, engines are important to the car. Yes, I know they're important, but this is an old car. You know it's an old car. You should take the risk of this. No, no, I think it's important that the engine be properly represented. <sighs> okay, I'll give that to you. You get the engine. Third thing, tires. Now we know one of the tires is bad, right? Whitehead, representation and warranty. Oh, come on already. I've given you windows and I've given you engines. Really, you want tires now too? This happens. Uh, in negotiations, right? Uh, I will be, I'm sending a noisy signal. I fight every time, but I concede for two of them. Third one, maybe I won't concede, but you do not know the difference. I, maybe I don't concede because I'm just tired. Oh, look, I'm tired. I've given away too much. How can I tell my client I'm doing my job? I've given away so much. Oh, look, let's go. How about two tires? We'll warrant on two tires and not on the other two. Just compromise. Who knows, right? The point is, that very often, because you are trying to, I'm not lying, am I lying? I'm not saying that the tires are all good, I'm not lying. It's just a strategy to try to make the, the problem noisier, less, less likely to detect. Good? Okay. Um, now, the truth is, the negotiation over reps and warranties is a combination. It is both cooperative and it is also a big fight. Uh, it's cooperative on standard terms. If I'm buying the company, I want a representation, I want a warranty that the company has been properly organized. Right? If you say no, that's a real problem. Right? If I'm buying the stock in the company, I want a representation that says the stock has been properly issued. If you say no, that's a big problem. Here it really should be cooperative. If I'm buying a tech company that is completely dependent upon a particular patent, and you're not going to give me a warranty on the patent, big problem, right? These are all standard discussions where there should just be almost no negotiation. But you can expect other uh, types of warranties because we're talking about transferring risk to involve fighting. Uh, and so it's usually a mixture of both. Some of it is very cooperative. You expect standard language to be agreed to very quickly, although what is standard may vary. Uh, and the other things very often are heavily negotiated. Okay, good so far? Okay, very often in reps and warranties, you will see two words. One is materiality and the other is knowledge. Um, the materiality qualifier is uh, very common. It tells you what to look for and knowledge tells you how hard to look. 
And really what we're saying is this. It, it, well, I'll give you some examples. But the point is, sometimes you're going to ask for a warranty. You're buying a company. And you say, I want to know uh, that um, all, all assets uh, belong to the company. Do I have to give you a warranty that all assets belong to the company? This asset belongs to me? I don't know, right? You know, the speaker belongs to the company? Do I have to give you a, do you care? If this table does not belong to the company, do you care? No, probably not, right? And so very often you'll see a qualification. All material assets are known to the company, right? Things that are substantial, things that are important, right? Things that you care about. Uh, also to the knowledge, right? Uh, knowledge also, it's another example of trying to limit the information. Um, uh, the company complies with law. Okay, I am a multinational company. I uh, operate in 70 countries. Should I really tell you that I comply with the parking laws in Tunisia? Right? Now, you could say material laws, or what you could say is to the knowledge of the company, we comply with law. And we'll see in a moment how that works. But again, the idea here is sometimes you don't need all this information. Getting this information is expensive, it's difficult, it's maybe too much risk. And so as a result, you'll sometimes see qualifications. It's very common that limit the amount of information you're asking for. Okay? Um, okay, so example. The target is not subject to any material litigation. Um, material litigation. What is that? What is material litigation? So it's very common in countries, I've run into lawyers outside the United States that define materiality with a dollar number. So for example, they will say material means a value in excess of $5 million. If it's a $100 million deal, they say it's something in excess of $5 million. And so in effect, what they're saying is the target is not subject to any litigation that involves an amount in excess of $5 million. In the U.S., we do not define this term, typically. Why not? Why not? Let's assume for a moment that there are 50 lawsuits that are brought, each for $4.9 million. Is that material? Well, if we define material as any one lawsuit in excess of $5 million, then the 50 lawsuits at $4.9 million aren't picked up. That would be a problem. But what else? All right, let's say this. Company is in compliance with all material laws, right? Or as opposed to company is compliance with all laws, all material laws. So you might say, well, that's laws where the damages, the cost, if we break the law, is in excess of $5 million. You okay with this? Yes? You're okay with this, okay. I'm not okay with this. It's okay, you can be okay with this. Let me ask you, if you define materiality with a dollar number, what's the benefit? The benefit is certainty, right? I know that 4.9 million, I don't have to worry about it. The problem with it maybe is also certainty, right? In other words, is material, is, is material simply limited to dollars? Let me ask you, uh, company is in compliance with all material laws. It turns out that the company sells a uh, million dollars worth of assets to terrorists in Iraq. Our damages are a million dollars because we sold them two million dollars. Let me ask you, do you want to buy a company that is selling uh, ammunition or arms to terrorists? No, right? No. So typically in the United States, we do not define materiality by way of a dollar amount. It goes to whether it is substantial to the nature of the transaction, the nature of what it is I'm buying. It's vague, it's intentionally vague. Why is it vague? Because if you're not sure, what are you going to do? You're the, you're the, you're the seller, I'm the buyer. You say, I'm not sure whether selling ammunition to Iraqi terrorists is good or bad. What are you going to do? 
I'm sorry? Well, you could lie. You could lie. Oh, why? Well, no, no, I'm sorry. What would you? No. So, in other words, I've asked for a warranty that, that says the company is compliant with all material law. Right? And I want some ambiguity in there. If we said $5 million is material and the damage is only $2 million, then you don't worry about it. Right? That's the benefit of certainty. But as a buyer, I don't like this. Right? If I know that you're selling you know, arms to terrorists, that's not a good thing, even if the value is less than $5 million. So you're not sure. Material is undefined. It means something that's important, that's core, that's valuable to the business. You're not sure. What are you going to do as the seller? What are you going to do? You might tell me. Right? Say, look, uh, we don't think this is material, but you should know about this. Let me ask you. Let's assume you hide it. Do you think you're going to hide it forever? When? Well, well hold on. It's your company. You're the ones that have entered into the contracts. Why not hide it? What the hell? Hide it. She, she's going to hide it. I can tell her, hey, look, she's saying, yeah, why not hide it? Yeah. Why not hide it? Why not hide it? Can you get away with it? You own the business now. You operate the business now. Who will own the business after the deal is closed? The, the, the buyer. The buyer will, right? Uh, who uh, the employees that worked for you that negotiated the sale of, these amu of this ammunition, who will they now work for? They'll work for me. Do you think you can really hide this? It's pretty hard, right? You're trying to hide it, I can tell. He's struggling with hiding it. That's no, okay. I, I have, I, believe, believe me, I'm a Wall Street guy. Hiding stuff is okay. Can you do it? Well, you can try. Well, that's true. So, so again, if it turns out that you can take the money and go to a beach, maybe I'm not comfortable with the warranties at all, right? Uh, in other words, if, that, if you can take the money and run to a beach, the warranties become much less valuable for me because how do I, how do I get this? How do I get the money back? Uh, so the baseline is I have to be comfortable that it's an enforceable warranty with value. Assuming it's an enforceable warranty with it, because if you can go to the beach, I can't do anything. Assuming it's an enforceable warranty with value, are you going to hide this? You know that the employees are going to come to me because they now work for me, and I will find out about this. So do you want to worry about me coming after you after the fact, maybe in a court, maybe publicly? Not so much. Uh, and so the ambiguity, the, the, the lack of definition is actually a good thing. It's going to force you to come and talk to me. The whole idea is to create more of an incentive for you to talk. If we said $5 million, yes or no, you have no interest to talk to me because the, 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 the damage is only $2 million. If we're not sure what material is, you have to decide. You have to really think about this. You might decide it's not material. That's fine. That's your decision. But you should be comfortable when you make this decision that I will find this information because I'm buying the company. Right? I will have control over the company and over the employees. Make sense? Okay. Um, there is no litigation pending against the target that if adversely attempt determined would have a material adverse effect on the target's business. Again, not clear what material adverse effect is. We will see that there is this concept that is defined <laughs> called material adverse change. We'll get to this in a moment. Um, okay, so what are we talking about? We have the signing of the agreement. This is when the warranties are given. So we sign the contract. You are selling me the yellow jiggly. I am buying it, or I'm selling it. You're buying it. We have the closing. The representations and warranties speak a second time, right? Once now when we sign the contract, once a week from now 
when I will give you the car, you will give me the money. Uh, and we have an indemnity, right? And remember, the indemnity says that if the reps and the warranties are inaccurate, that you can go ahead uh, as the buyer and sue me, assuming I'm not on a beach, you can sue me uh, for, purposes, for, for, for breach of the reps and warranties. And again, the one question, we'll get to this tomorrow, is why do I need the indemnity? If I've got a warranty, why do I need it? But this is the general timeline, right? Contract is signed, reps and warranties are in the contract, they speak a second time at the closing. We have the ability to bring a claim for breach of the reps and warranties under the indemnity. At some point, however, the indemnity terminates. And we'll spend more time uh, tomorrow on the indemnity. Good so far? Okay. Um, okay, definition of knowledge. So, you will typically not see a definition of materiality. You will typically see a definition of knowledge. Uh, to the company's knowledge, to the knowledge of certain people. So in the case of knowledge, you're talking about actual awareness or what a prudent person would be expected to know. It's very general, right? So in other words, if you say, to the knowledge of the company, the uh, company complies with all laws, this statement is based upon their actual knowledge. If they actually know they're not in compliance, that's a problem or it's based upon what a prudent person reasonably should know. So what are we saying here? We're saying, who do you, what do you think happens when the company gives a representation about to the knowledge? So you are the company's lawyers. Congratulations. You are the company's lawyers. And you have negotiated, to our knowledge, the company is in compliance with all laws. And we know it's actual knowledge or what a prudent person could be expected to know. What are you going to do at that stage? You sign it, you move on? As the lawyer, what do you do? What do you do? Kamchatka, what do you do? What do you do? Company has, right, we have, we have the knowledge qualification, right, to our knowledge. So you're the lawyers, and you've beaten me. I say, I want a rep that says, Company is in compliance with all laws. And you beat me and you say, Whitehead, it's got to be to our knowledge the company is in compliance with all laws. And I say, okay, you win, to our knowledge. We'll define knowledge, actual awareness, or what a prudent individual could be expected to know. In the case of a company, it's the knowledge of someone who is or at any time served as an officer, right? So we're talking, in the case of a company, it's directors and officers now or in the past. In the case of people, it's individuals, uh, or we might define it in terms of specific individuals. We might say, um, when we're talking about the representation of the company, it's the representation of the CEO, the chief financial officer, the chief legal officer. You can identify exactly, right? Instead of saying it's all officers, all directors, you can identify whose knowledge you care about. Okay, so you've beaten me. You have knowledge. Now what do you do? Go home, have some champagne, dance around. No. What do you do now? What do you do? To the knowledge of the company. Remember, right? The definition is what a person is know knows or reasonably could be expected to know in the course of conducting a comprehensive investigation. <coughs> right? Something they know or reasonably should know. What are you going to do? Okay, so, well, how do you, so ask who? To the client, to the, to the client, right? And what are you going to say to, the, what are you going to tell the client they should do? Re well, okay. Again, it's, it's actual awareness of what they could be expected to know, right? Could be, should, what they should know, in other words. Uh, so what, what are you going to tell the client? By the way, the reason it's done as actual awareness or what they should know, ignorance is not a defense, right? If it was just actual awareness, then stupid CEOs can get away with anything. Because, oh, I'm stupid, I didn't know anything, Right? So it's not done this way, right? It's actual awareness or what a prudent person could be expected to know if they conduct an investigation. 
Okay, so what, so what are you going to tell the client? So dumb CEO is not a defense. What are you going to tell the CEO? What are you going to tell the customer, the, the client? What should they do? Well, so similar to this, yeah. So what you do is you go to the client and you say, look, the definition is what a prudent person would be expected to know, discover, if they do a comprehensive investigation. Guess what? Investigate. Is that due it's kind of due diligence, yeah. It's an, but due diligence is usually where I due diligence you, right? The buyer due diligence is the seller. The seller due diligence is the buyer. This is internal, right? This is basically you guys say, to your knowledge, the company is in compliance with law. Now you want to do your own investigation to verify that actually, within reason, you're comfortable the, comp the company really is in compliance. In other words, this language is, f is the, the buyer forcing the seller to do an internal review. You may have already done the review. Maybe you don't need anything. Client says to you, don't worry about it. We've done the review. We know this. Everything's good. Or the client says, well, we haven't done a review recently. Yes, we'll go back and take a look at this. So effectively, what we're doing is, as the buyer, forcing the seller to have their own internal people conduct this investigation. We're not hiring an outsider. Right? We could hire a mechanic right, or someone to check the yellow jiggly, right? Now I'm saying you should check the yellow jiggly. You should be the ones who have the most knowledge, should be the ones that verify. Ignorance is not a defense. Right? What you prudently should know, reasonably should know, you should verify this as part of the warranty that you're giving me. Good? You're looking troubled. You're okay? Okay. Um, let me give you my favorite example, Grumman v. Rohr, famous case. Okay, so this is a ca case where Grumman, very big company, they do aircraft, large, uh, large vehicles. They are buying the flexible business uh, from a company called Roar. And I gotta tell you, Grumman was represented by a major law firm. Flexible is in the business of making buses. They make public buses. And while the deal is being negotiated, uh, one of the prototypes for the flexible buses, uh, the A-frame, the core of the bus, cracks. Uh, Grumman knows the testing is happening. They never ask for test results. Uh, they did get the results after the sale was closed. Sale was done. They said, okay, here are the results. And if you re read the results, you saw A-frame was cracked. It was a big problem with uh, the bus. The bus, apparently they sell the bus anyways to New York City. Uh, it turns out the bus fails and they have to buy back all the buses and it's a huge disaster. A lot of losses to uh, Grumman. So Grumman sues Roar, uh, Roar over the, the failure to uh, have these, uh, these, these, these A-frames in place and the failure to disclose. They sue them on reps and warranties. Okay, so Grumman clearly did some diligence. But the question is, is diligence alone good enough? So this is kind of like what we were talking about. Okay, so let's assume for a moment you are the employee of Roar, okay? And you know that the A-frame is bad. You know this, because you're the one responsible. And I've conducted due diligence. Uh, so I ask you, A-frame good or bad? What's your answer gonna be? Well, he's, he's, he's the employee, senior employee of, uh, of Roar. Uh, part of the flexible unit, so I am buying this unit that you are a senior employee of. Well, uh, Goose Creek is my chef. I'm not, I'm not in right to make some statements. Well, no, you are. You are the, you're the guy. You're the testing guy. Well, if I'm a testing guy, then I'm afraid that uh, people look at home or, uh, or this bus is... Well, yeah, you're, you're worried. Maybe you are a testing guy with some moral feeling. Uh, but we're not talking about morality here. Let me ask you, if you tell me the truth, the A-frame is a problem, am I gonna buy this business? No. What's gonna happen to you? Sorry? 
you're fired, right? Okay, let's assume you lie and you tell me, no, no, A-frame is really good and I buy this business and now you work for me. What's going to happen? You're fired. Yeah, yeah. That's the problem with talking simply to employees, right? Due diligence alone, very often with employees, places them in an almost impossible position. <laughs> because if they say something that's negative, their current employer gets angry at them. If they say something that is not accurate, the new employer is angry at them. Uh, and so what does it mean? It means that you cannot simply rely upon due diligence. It has to be in the contract, right? Another way of saying it is, if it's important to you, if the A-frames are that critical, you should put in a representation that says the A-frames are good. It, it shouldn't simply be based upon a discussion. It should be what's in the contract so that we get away from the personal tension that any individual employee has. Uh, okay, in the case of this deal, there are these provisions in the contract. It says, very common, uh, except for warranties in the contract, no other statement is the basis for reliance by the other party. Neither party can rely upon a representation or warranty that is not set forth in this contract. Um, this is referred to as, it's called a merger clause. What it basically says is the only things you can rely upon in terms of warranties are things in the contract. And the reason is because, this is, what the hell? This is New York calling me. Yeah, it's New York. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're angry. They're saying, you shouldn't be telling them these secrets. No, um, uh, the, the problem is, right, that uh, if it's not in the contract, I really cannot rely upon this. What these merger provisions do is they say, look, you're going to be talking to me. If you are the seller, I really don't know what he's saying. Right? I may be talking to hundreds of different people. If you're the seller, do you want to take responsibility for what the 100 people said? No, right? It makes no sense because you don't know what they're saying. So what this provision says is, if it's important to you, buyer, put it in the contract. Anything else, we're not responsible for. It's a very, very common provision. Um, in the case of this deal, the warranty is really bad. Uh, it's, uh, it's very incomplete. Uh, it says the construction, the techniques have not yet been tested. No reps or warranties are made about the testing. Uh, the only warranty is regarding the design of the company. And Roar has the right to use the design. Very general. In other words, they speak, there, there's nothing in there about the A-frame and the quality of the A-frame. Uh, and as a result, they cannot, they have, they have no basis to rely upon this. When it turns out the A-frame is broken, they, Grumman lost in this case. They went back and tried to sue for breach of contract, and the court said, can't. The representations and warranties are the only thing you can rely, up, rely upon. Oral statements are excluded, and the reps and warranties do not talk about the A-frame. That's it. If it was important to you, Grumman, it should have been in the contract. So what they should have done is had detailed disclosures, right? schedules. We talked about attaching the schedules, lots of information attached to the contract a representation regarding the accuracy of the information that Roar provides, or at least material information, right? like the A-frame. If the A-frame is so important, I should have included that in the reps and warranties, and I should go ahead and make sure the reps and warranties speak time of signing and, again, the time of the closing. Good? Sure? Okay. That's it uh, for this. Why don't we do covenants? We have how many minutes? We have 15 minutes, right? Sorry? 20 minutes, okay. So we'll start covenants, we'll continue tomorrow. And again, the I, covenants are a little easier. Not really, but uh, let's put up covenants. Okay, so reps and warranties are dealing with what's called pre-contractual opportunism. It's the fact, before we enter into a contract, you know things that I don't know. You can take advantage of me based upon the things that you know. And the way in which I get rid of this problem is reps and warranties, right? I, the contract is a, is a way for me to get comfortable. We avoid discounting the price. We avoid the cost of hiring a mechanic. That's the whole idea behind reps and warranties. Covenants uh, are really uh, reflecting the information problem after the contract is signed. 
after the contract is signed. So when we're talking about reps and warranties, it's dealing with information, the gap before the contract is signed. When we're talking about uh, covenants, it's dealing with also an information problem that arises after the contract is signed. And again, the example for this is the insurance market. So let's assume for a moment I'm an insurer again. A lot of this stuff comes out of insurance. I'm the insurer again. And I want to give a policy, and I want to price the policy. Right? Again, I'm worried about pricing. So before it was prenatal care, now it's going to be uh, sickness. Insurance against sickness. So I go ahead and I price the policy, and I deliver it to you. Is your behavior going to change? Before, if you were sick, you would say, oh, I have to go to the doctor, I have to pay some money. Uh, maybe I'm not that sick. Now, if I give you insurance that says everything that you go to the doctor for, I will pay, does it change your behavior? Okay. What is it? What happens? You go to the doctor. Much more, right? Again, it's an informational problem. I don't know exactly the effect on you. I think you will go to the doctor more, but how much more? I don't know. But it's a problem of information after the contract, in this case now it's after the policy has been entered into, uh, your behavior changes because of the policy, right? It's different than prenatal care. I, I, I'm assuming most people don't say, let's get prenatal insurance, let's have kids now. I don't think it works that way, right? But in this case, it does work, right? I now have this policy that protects me uh, against the cost of going to the doctor. I'm much more likely now to go to the doctor, but I don't know how much. Same thing with a uh, performance warranty on your computer, right? If I give you a 100% performance warranty on your computer, maybe you don't care so much about spilling coffee on it, right? Because again, of the, of the policy. So we're dealing with an informational problem. I do not know how it will affect you. I know it will affect you, but how much I don't know. And because of this, I can't price the insurance, right? I don't know because you're going to use it much more. How much more, I don't know. And so it's difficult for me to figure out the cost, what I should charge for this insurance. Good? Um, typically, when you're talking about, this is referred to as moral hazard uh, in economics. Typically, when you talk about moral hazard, there are two conditions to there being moral hazard. The first is that the interests of the parties is different. Right? So the interest of the insurance company is different than, than your interest as the insurance uh, beneficiary. Um, uh, I want to sell more insurance at lower price with less use. You want cheaper insurance, covers more, uh, potentially at higher cost to me. Okay? Uh, the other requirement is that the party's behavior is difficult to observe. Again, I can't look into your head. I don't know how this change will affect you now that you have insurance, how much more will you go to the doctor? How much more careless will you be with your laptop? I don't know. And so it's difficult for me to observe um, uh, or, or verify your behavior. Again, it's another information problem. In insurance, we have a number of ways in contract to address this. So in contract, typically when you're talking about health insurance, we have deductibles or copayments. Are you familiar with deductibles and copays? I, it's, I think it's less common here in Ukraine. Okay, uh, a deductible and a copay. So wh when I go to uh, the doctor in the United States, uh, the first $20 I must pay. It's called a deductible. Or the first $20 we each evenly pay. Right? I pay 10, the insurance company pays 10. And the idea here is if it's a serious problem, real illness, well then I'll go to the doctor. If it's something small, I don't want to pay $20, right? If the, uh, it, it makes no sense for me. So it's a way to shape behavior. What we're doing is limiting the moral hazard through uh, increasing the cost to me through deductibles and copayments of going to the doctor. Experience rating. We will adjust the price based upon how often I go to the doctor. If I go to the doctor a lot, the price will go up over time. Not so much the price goes down. Uh, limits and ceilings on coverage. So we will simply cap the amount uh, so in any year, you can go to the doctor five times uh, or ten times, right? Something reasonable. Or you can have more, no more than $1,000 in normal expense or something. But we will cap the amount under the uh, insurance or we can always terminate the contract, terminate the policy. I'm sorry, 
you go to the doctor much too much. Or if you spill too much coffee on the laptop, we no longer have a, a warranty, right? Uh, generally, we're trying to penalize bad behavior, right? Reward good behavior. Um, we want to reduce cheating. Uh, in other words, I can't observe what you're doing, and so I want to reduce the incentive for you to behave in a way that hurts me. If you're familiar with startups, startups in the United States, you get lots of stock options. In many large US companies, you get lots of stock options. Why? Why should I give you stock? I, when I was in practice, when I, I worked at a bank. Actually, I didn't mention, I, I ran a bank. I forgot, anyways. Uh, I gave out lots of stock options. Why? Because I'm a nice guy. No, why was I giving out stock options? Yeah, but why? What, what is, how does it do this? Motivate, there you go, right? In other words, I give out stock options because if you work hard and the company does well, the stock goes up and your options go up. So it's a way, so think about it this way, right? You come to my office to ask for a job, right? And uh, I sit down and I say, hey, will you show up at work at eight o'clock? He said, of course. Will you stay into at the office until midnight? Why not? Will you come in on the weekends? I was expecting to come in on the weekends. Uh, lunchtime, 30 minutes? 30 minutes, that's 20 minutes too long, right? Uh, okay, you're hired. Now you have the contract. Will your behavior change? Maybe, right? Maybe now instead of eight o'clock, it's nine o'clock. Maybe it's three hour lunch with martinis, who knows, right? I, it's, again, it's this moral hazard problem. We've entered into a contract. Your behavior changed because of the contract. It's the same information. So when we're talking, in your head, you're saying, Psh, 8 o'clock, no way. 10 o'clock, maybe. Saturday, Sunday, Psh, are you kidding? Maybe not even Friday in your head, right? But I can't read this, right? I can't read into this head. But now that you've become an employee, I can give you a strong incentive to show up. I could also terminate you, right? If it turns out you're really bad, I just fire you. But so long as you're doing a generally good job, I give you stock options to motivate you to work hard. It's a way to address this moral hazard problem, right? This potential change in behavior once you're employed. Uh, of course, I can monitor you. I can just simply check to make sure you're doing your job. And in the case of uh, mergers and acquisitions agreements, it's covenants. Covenants are the way to address this moral hazard concern. Um, so just quickly, when we talked about reps and warranties, right, we're dealing with adverse selection. This is information that you know that I don't know before the contract is signed. In the case of moral hazard, it's something that happens after the contract is signed. In the case of an M&A deal, we'll see it's between the signing and the closing. That's the period we're worried about. But it's after the contract is signed. Uh, the behavior we're worried about, in the case of uh, adverse selection, we're worried that you're going to uh, try to get a better deal by hiding things, right? By, uh, by not telling me the truth about the yellow jiggly. In the case of moral hazard, you're going to, now that the contract is entered into, your behavior changes, you will try to get things that benefit you that hurt me under this contract. Uh, the response and adverse selection is reps and warranties, closing conditions and the indemnity, we'll come back to these. In the case of moral hazard, it's covenants. But it's the exact same kind of problem. The timing is different, right? Reps and warranties address the information problem before we sign the contract, covenants after we sign but before closing. Good? Okay. So, just to recall, right, purchase agreement is signed, reps and warranties speak twice. Once at the signing, once at the closing, uh, and the indemnity uh, at some future date terminates. Um, okay, so when we're talking about covenants, there are three types of covenants in the case of a, an acquisition agreement. There is bilateral covenants. These are covenants that both of us agree to. Right? Seller agrees to them, buyer agrees to them. So we both agree to do whatever is necessary to get the deal done. We both covenant to this, right? Mutually, we should. You want to get the deal done, I want to get the deal done. We both agree we will try to do this. By the way, what is a covenant? It's a kind of agreement, yeah, well, yeah. 
what is a covenant? How, how many of you know the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark? Okay, Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's, it's, the, it's the covenant, right? It's the lost, the, 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 the ark is the ark of the covenant in the movie. Ah, it's the ark of the covenant. Go back and watch the movie. So what's this covenant? By the way, the terrible thing about being a law professor and liking movies is now almost everything I teach, I can tie to a movie. It's really bad. I haven't done it today. This is just the one time. But I, I, in, in New York, I'm, my students think I'm crazy. Not the, well, I heard the face melting thing. No. What, 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 is a, what, what, what kind of an agreement is the covenant? The Ark of the Covenant. It's a promise to do something or not to do something is what it is. So a warranty is basically a guarantee, right? A representation is a statement of fact. A warranty is a guarantee that the fact is accurate. So I warranty that the tires are in good shape. I warranty that the business is good. Right? In the case of a covenant, it's an agreement to do or not to do something. I agree I will get the deal done. I agree I will not do certain things. Right? It could be an affirmative covenant or a negative covenant. So we can both agree to get the deal done. The seller can covenant that it will continue to operate the business. Uh, buyer has the ability to investigate the business. Uh, a a no-shop clause, a non-compete clause, we'll talk about these. Uh, and of course, the buyer covenants that it has the money. This is the earlier point about reps and warranties. The buyer says, yeah, I covenant, I have the money. Okay. So, the relevant period when we're dealing with an acquisition agreement is between the signing and the closing. So, we're talking about this period here. The contract is signed, and then the deal is closed. Right, so in the Yellow Jiggly, we sign the contract. I agree to sell you the Yellow Jiggly, you will pay me takes one week for you to get the 5,000 grivna. At some future date, you will give me the 5,000 grivna, I will give you the car, right? So when we sign the contract, that's at this point when the agreement is signed, we will close, in this case, one week later, and the reps and the warranties speak one week later. So it's this period that the covenants are, wor are worried about, the, the, the time period between the signing of the deal and the closing of the deal. So what are we worried about? What are we worried about? So. I am the seller of the yellow jiggly. You are the buyers. 5,000 grivna. It's going to take me a week to act, well, it's going to take you a week to get the money. And so for a one week period, you are obligated to buy the yellow jiggly. You've agreed. You've signed. You will buy the yellow, you've, you've entered into a contract. And I agree to sell it to you. I can't sell it to somebody else. I've agreed to sell it to you so long as all the conditions are satisfied. So long as you give me the money, I give you the car, the deal is done in one week. Are you worried about something? Yeah, about the tires. What's oh, the, the tires? Well, you don't like tires. I gave you reps and warranties about the tires. I'm sorry? You won't have money? Oh, you mean me as you mean me as the as the well, yeah. Again, you have to be comfortable that you can get me, right? So maybe I have a nice house that you can go after, or I have, in addition to my yellow Jiggly, I have my Mercedes uh, M7 you can go after, who know, or my BMW M7 you can go after. Right? It's up to you, right? But yes, you still have to be comfortable that I have the assets. What else are you worried about, though? Something may wrong may occur with the car. Now, part of that is fixed through reps and warranties, right? Right? You're, you're right. Part of that is fixed through reps and warranties. So if I repped that the tires are good and the tires aren't good at closing, then it means the reps and warranties are no longer accurate. You can walk away, right? As the buyer, you... By the way, do you think you will walk away? What will happen usually? Turns out the tires aren't good. We get to the closing. Reps and the warranties speak twice, right? I repped the tires are good. We get to the closing. The tires are not good. The way the closing works, you don't have to buy. You don't have to buy, right? The reps have to be accurate at the closing for you to give me the money. If reps aren't accurate, you don't give me the five thousand grivna. Are you going to walk away? 
you might do this, right? Uh, so, so, so really what's going to happen is you're going to renegotiate the deal, right? I don't want you to walk away as the seller, right? We negotiated the deal. By the way, if you walk away, right, we had a deal for 5,000 grivne. He's your friend. He walks away. Will you buy this car now? No, right? It's called damaged goods, right? There's a reputational problem. In the M&A world, it's a big issue. Why did this guy not buy? What was so bad he walked away? Uh, so there's a real incentive on my part to negotiate. I want you to buy this car, right? And we're going to renegotiate the price. You're going to say, hey, I can walk away, Whitehead. I can walk away, fix the tires. And then we'll close, right? And so typically you renegotiate. But the way the closing conditions are written, you can just walk away. You can just walk away. Okay, so one of the concerns is the reps and the warranties may not be accurate. Okay, good. What else are we concerned about during that one week period? Sorry? A car crash, okay. So related to that, if the car really crashes, right? So the engine doesn't work, the glass is broken, the tires don't work, Reps and warranties protect you, right? Yeah, kind of, but it's, it's, uh, the other so we might renegotiate again, right? If, if I wreck the car, there's something wrong with the tires, the windows, the engine, we might renegotiate, right? Same thing, it's okay, we can renegotiate. One of the what? Oh, one of the parties may walk away. Yeah, th yeah. That, I mean, that's possible that, you know, I'm ill or you're ill or something. In the case of a corporate, large corporate deal, not a big issue. Maybe in the yellow jiggly it is. Uh, but I'm really healthy. Don't worry, I'm really healthy. Well, we'll get to force majeure in a moment. Not force majeure. Let me ask you. I'm the seller. Are you worried that I will treat this car in the same way I treated it before we signed the contract? Before we signed the contract, I took this car home every night at 6 o'clock. I drove it nowhere except my office and home, home and office. I park it in a nice garage. I take out a baby's diaper and I clean it every night gently. It is the perfect yellow jiggly. Now, we have signed a contract. In a week, this car is yours. Are you worried that maybe I don't treat the car the same way? Yeah, right? That's the big concern. We've entered, again, think about it. We've entered into a contract. In this case, it's a purchase agreement, not an insurance contract, but it's a purchase agreement, it's still a contract. And you're worried that I, my, my behavior may change. Right? Just like the uh, uh, doctors, the health insurance, just like the laptop, now we have a purchase agreement, and you think, well, now that Whitehead has signed this agreement, maybe he's not going to take, maybe he will do what guys do on Simskaya at 3 in the morning, which is race up and down the street. You know this, right? Uh, unfortunately, I have jet lag, so I'm awake sometimes at 3 in the morning, and you're up and down Simskaya. Okay? That, maybe Whitehead will do this for a week. Right? And so long as nothing is broken, I haven't crashed, my tires aren't gone, right? then the reps and warranties don't cover it. Are you happy if I'm racing the car at 3 o'clock at Simskaya? Yes. Of course. Uh, yes? <laughs> yeah, no, no, okay. No, not at all, right? Uh, and so that's what covenants do. They address the same. You don't know what I will do once we've signed this contract. You don't know how my behavior will change. Or if I'm selling a business, will I operate the business in the same way? Will I be as careful at maintaining the factories? Usually... The, the time period is not a week between the signing and the closing. It's months, sometimes years. Why? You need regulatory approvals. Maybe you need third-party approvals. Maybe it's financing. It's not a week. It's months and months and months. Again, it could be over a year between the signing and the closing. And you want to be sure as the buyer that I'm not changing the way I run the business, that I'm still operating it consistent with what you thought you were buying when we signed the contract. And that's what covenants get at. Uh, okay, um, so when we're talking about covenants, like reps and warranties, are we okay on time? Oh, rats, we're over time, son of a gun. Okay, we will pick up 
with uh, covenants tomorrow, and then we'll finish uh, some of the other provisions in the contract, uh, like the indemnity. The indemnity is fun. Um, and then what we'll also then do tomorrow is begin to talk about some of the core contracts around startups, uh, things like founders agreements. Uh, and uh, depending on time, we may have time to talk about things like structuring the entity itself. Uh, when we go through founders agreements, there are also some real tricks in these agreements. They apply, we'll, we'll be looking at founders agreements, these same provisions apply equally in M&A deals, in all sorts of corporate transactions. Uh, so we'll look at some of the language. I, uh, have you had a chance to print out the, uh, the forms, that I, the, the different contracts that I sent? Do we, okay, so, so tomorrow we should bring those, I guess, yeah. We have ten, so it's uh, them I'm sorry? We have ten. Oh, this, oh, they have it already? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, good. So we'll talk about founders agreements and others, other documents, but when we go through them, I'll show you some of the kind of funny provisions in them. But the key point is, understand, deal lawyers, you know, think of these things as all kind of being the same thing. The context is different. A founder's agreement is different than an M&A deal, but the issues are the same. They are all information issues, and the tools that are used are the same as well, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. Good. Thanks very much.